My name is uh, Ben Freed. I am an assistant professor of medicine at Northwestern. Um, despite uh, what some people think I'm someone's little brother, but I've actually been, uh, yeah, I have to get that out early on. I've actually been practicing for about eight years now, so that's out of fellowship for eight years. I've been in attending. Um, and uh, I work, um, you know, my, my specialty is non-invasive cardiology. So I, I do echocardiography, I do cardiac MRI, and about two years after I got to Northwestern, uh, Dr. Richard Burt, who I think a lot of you know, he was here this morning, um, who also was at Northwestern, um, talked to me uh, about joining this multidisciplinary team um, in order to have patients come for stem cell transplant treatment. And he wanted uh, me and another cardiologist to be the cardiologists who were responsible for risk assessment prior to stem cell, uh, because we found out through a lot of our own studies and, and, and some other people's studies that the heart really plays a huge role in how well you do with transplantation. And so that's what I've been doing now for the last about five, six years. And so I see a lot of patients uh, with scleroderma. And um, uh, this conference, it, it's, this is a, just an amazing opportunity to be here. I, I have spoken at you know a lot of cardiac conferences on different topics, and I have to tell you, this is, for me, really one of the most special uh, conferences to speak at because I get to speak to patients. Um, I, I get to do more of a teaching type of thing than just spitting out data. Um, so this talk is really going to be more about teaching, about education. Um, and because of that, I want it to be interactive. Uh, you know, I, I don't need to go through this whole thing and then we ask safe questions until the end. I want you to ask questions as I go along because I'm sure someone else has a question about it and so we can all understand before we move forward, okay? The other thing is that my email uh, is on here and it's on your handout there. Feel free, if you have any questions that maybe you don't want to ask now or that come up later, feel free to just email me and I'm, I'm happy to respond to you. Um, and, uh, and that's it. I don't have any specific handouts either, but if you have something specific that you are interested in within cardiology or cardiac complications with scleroderma, uh, email me and let me know and I can get you that reference and I can get you that handout, okay? All right. Any questions before we get started? All right, and the other thing is I don't want to be right behind this podium the whole time, so I'm going to move around a little bit maybe, but if you can't hear me in the back of the room, just raise your hand, let me know, I'll move back behind the podium. Okay, but I'll try to project. All right, these are my disclosures. Okay, so I, I've broken this talk up in, into these, uh, you know, these, these elements here. So. We're going to start talking about the pathophysiology of cardiac involvement. How does scleroderma affect the heart, okay? And then we're going to talk about the manifestations of heart disease. So what, what are the clinical signs, symptoms of heart disease when it comes to uh, in patients with scleroderma? We're going to spend um, a lot of time talking about diagnostic cardiac tests, some of which you probably know. Uh, some of the stuff I'm going to talk about is a little... Uh, out there a little more in the research realm, but interesting, and I thought, you know, I would talk about it nonetheless. Um, and then we're going to move into cardiac therapeutics, what kinds of medications, uh, et cetera, do we use for cardiac disease, and then end up with um, an algorithm that I think um, is, is useful. We use it at Northwestern for identifying and treating uh, heart disease. Okay. So, this is something everyone here is familiar with. You know, uh, scleroderma is a systemic disease, uh, multi-organ manifestations, right? So with the skin, there's skin thickening, calcinosis, ulcers, uh, vascular, you get the Raynaud's and uh, telangiectasias, renal crisis. With GI, you get dysmotility of the esophagus, pulmonary, pulmonary fibrosis, and pulmonary arterial hypertension, which we'll spend some time talking about. Cardiac, we'll obviously spend a ton of time talking about that. And then, of course, arthralgias, myopathies, more in the musculoskeletal realm. So this talk is really going to be focused on 
not only cardiac but pulmonary too, uh, because they're so interlinked and, and, and one affects the other, so we can't talk about one without the other. Okay. This slide is um, simplistic. It's, it, it talks about sort of the usual timing of problems in patients with a scleroderma, but obviously it, it doesn't fit for everyone. But one of the things I liked about it is it does divide the timing between diffuse cutaneous variant and limited cutaneous variant. And I call your attention to the fact that this myocardial involvement is primarily in the diffuse. Not to say that limited can't get it, they do, but we see it much more commonly in the diffuse variant. And it happens somewhat a little later in the time course for the most part. Um, whereas pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary arterial hypertension, that's something we see more often in the limited. The, the diffuse is more of the fibrotic kind of process, and the limited, we think, is more of the vasculopathy type of process. Um, in terms of causes of adverse outcomes in scleroderma, this is a, a study from a couple of years ago that looked at a huge cohort. You're probably familiar with this U-Star cohort. Uh, over 7,000 patients with scleroderma, both the diffuse and the limited uh, variant. Uh, this cohort, about 10 to 30 percent, were clinically symptomatic. They, they had symptoms, but they were, the vast majority were subclinical, meaning that they didn't have any symptoms, no overt symptoms, but with imaging or other tests, we could see that they had problems with their heart or other organs. Um, call your attention to the fact that over on the far left there, the red represents patients with diffuse, uh, 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 diffuse cutaneous variant, and those patients, the, the highest cause of adverse outcome is lung fibrosis, whereas in the limited, it's, it's more PAH. And then cardiac involvement is probably the second most common cause of adverse outcomes in the diffuse population. And it's probably second or third or maybe even later on in the limited. And that's because limited, we just don't see as much cardiac involvement. Um, the diffuse uh, uh, variant seems to have more symptoms when it comes to cardiac and more severe involvement than the limited. Okay. So how does scleroderma affect the heart? So you can either get primary involvement or secondary involvement. Primary is the direct effect of scleroderma on the heart, and we'll talk about what that means in a second. And secondary means indirect effects. So pulmonary arterial hypertension, which I'll describe in a little more detail later, can indirectly affect the heart and cause problems for the heart. Now, many patients have more than one problem, right? It's, it's very rare that someone has just one of these. Um, the two key components, the two key components of how scleroderma affect the heart are vasospasm, and vasospasm is when the vessels, in the, in the case of the heart, the coronary vessels, spasm. They, they basically close off and block blood flow, um, and inflammation, okay? So to get a little more specific about this, if you start up there on the top left, right, you have coronary microvascular vasospasm. And that, in turn, will cause focal ischemia. Ischemia is lack of blood flow. So in that area where there's vasospasm, there is focal ischemia or lack of blood flow. And then this turns into this recurrent ischemia, reperfusion injury, and there becomes damage in the surrounding myocardium or muscle of the heart in that area. And then that leads to myocardial fibrosis. Fibrosis you've heard about again and again. That's the thickening, the stiffness. That's what happens to the heart muscle. So if you go back to the top left, inflammation. Inflammation can cause problems with the heart muscle. That's called myocarditis. That's inflammation of the, of the myocardium. And then that, too, can lead to myocardial fibrosis. And then myocardial fibrosis, in turn, can cause everything from heart failure to conduction system fibrosis, so the electrical system of the heart gets fibrosed, and you end up with bradyarrhythmias, meaning that signal from the top to the bottom part of the heart is, is somehow uh, gets disconnected, and you can end up with problems that way. And then tachyarrhythmias, meaning high heart rate type of arrhythmias. A lot of patients have that as well. 
And then if you move downward from the top left, inflammation can also affect the pericardium, okay? The pericardium is the sac around the heart. And what can happen when inflammation affects that is that you get pericardial inflammation and then fibrosis, just like you do in the heart muscle, in the myocardium. And that thicken, that the inflammation and that fibrosis causes thickening of the pericardium. And that can actually cause something called constrictive pericarditis. And what that is, is essentially when you have this thick rind, basically, around the heart, the heart can't expand properly. It's like in a cage, and that can cause problems. And then you can also get fluid uh, in the actual pericardium, in the sac around the heart, and that can also cause constriction of the heart. It doesn't allow the heart to, uh, to expand, just like the thickened pericardium. And that can lead to something called tamponade. Tamponade is a life-threatening condition when there's too much fluid around the heart, and you have to get the fluid out because the heart can't expand, okay? The tamponade, T-A-M, M as in Mary, P-O, N as in Nancy, A, D, E. Sure. Any other questions? Okay. All right. So how does all of this then affect patients with scleroderma? How, how do they present themselves? Well. I'm going to start by saying that the vast, the vast majority of patients that we see when it comes to the heart have subclinical symptoms, meaning that they do not have overt signs of heart failure or arrhythmias or pericarditis or anything like that. It's stuff we detect on our imaging or our monitors or our catheterizations. So it's subclinical. I would say more often than not, out of this whole list that I'm going to give you, the majority of patients come in with symptoms of palpitations from arrhythmias, and probably also a type of heart failure called diastolic heart failure, which I'll explain in a second, okay? But vast majority don't have cardiac symptoms, per se. Okay, so we're going to start with left ventricular dysfunction. So in this picture here, the left ventricle... Um, is the part of the heart that collects blood from the lungs and it pumps the blood to the rest of the body. That's the left ventricle. And uh, patients who have left ventricular dysfunction, they commonly get symptoms such as chest pain uh, and more often than not, shortness of breath. And this is the type of shortness of breath that isn't necessarily at rest, but particularly when you exert yourself and you make the heart work harder, you get more short of breath. And then you stop, you rest, and then you can move on. That's the type of shortness of breath I'm talking about. And then swelling as well. And I'm not talking about swelling in a joint or just a single arm or leg. It's usually much more diffuse. A lot of times it's in both legs. Sometimes it's in the stomach. But that's the kind of swelling I'm talking about. These patients also feel like they can't lie flat because they feel like they're, they can't breathe. That's another sign uh, of left ventricular dysfunction, okay? So there are two types of heart failure. And so left, dis left ventricular dysfunction causes heart failure. And when I say heart failure, it's the same thing as congestive heart failure. Some people get that confused. It's the same thing. And there are two types of it. One is systolic dysfunction. What that means is the pump, the left ventricle, is diminished. It's not pumping normally. And I'll show you an example of that pretty soon, okay? The other type, which I mentioned just a little earlier, is diastolic dysfunction. In this type, which is much more common than systolic dysfunction in patients with scleroderma, the pump is actually pumping fine. The problem is, is that the heart is not taking the time to fill with blood. And that actually can cause the same symptoms 
as when your pump is not working normally. And that's called diastolic dysfunction, okay? Usually this is an insidious onset. It's gradual. It's many, many years before you actually start having symptoms from this. The only really, uh, really acute cases come when you have acute myocarditis. So again, myocarditis is inflammation of the muscle. And if you get an acute case of that, you can develop left ventricular dysfunction. And you can be symptomatic pretty quickly. Yeah? What would cause that? Myocarditis? Yes. So scleroderma itself can cause it, just from the inflammation. But a lot of times, even viruses, bacteria infections, uh, mostly viruses, though, can cause myocarditis, too. Myocarditis is, is a very generic term. It just means inflammation of the myocardium. So a lot of different things can cause it. Yeah. For myocarditis, actually, for a lot of, for, most patients don't have symptoms of myocarditis. If it doesn't affect the pericardium, which we'll talk about in a second, most patients don't actually have symptoms. But sometimes the myocarditis is, is a type of entity, a type of either virus or something that affects the heart so much that it causes left ventricular dysfunction. And then you end up with these symptoms. But I would say more often than not, it's a good question, you don't actually have symptoms from myocarditis. Okay? Okay. All right. So now let's move to the other side of the heart, the right ventricle. So the right ventricle, as shown here in this picture, is the part of the heart that collects blood from the body, puts it into the lungs to give it to the left ventricle to pump it out. Okay? The right ventricle is extremely important, and we're learning more and more about this as we're doing our research into cardiac manifestations of, of, of scleroderma. So, and I'll go into that in a little bit. But if, with the right ventricle, the symptoms are very similar to the left ventricle. It's the same kind of heart failure symptoms, shortness of breath, swelling, things like that. The right ventricle can be affected primarily right, by inflammation. Uh, by vasospasm, same things that affect the left ventricle. But one unique thing about the right ventricle is that it can also be affected secondarily, indirectly, by pulmonary hypertension because the right ventricle ejects blood into the lungs. So they are very interconnected. And if the pressures in the lungs are high, that's going to cause the right ventricle to become dysfunctional over time. It's a plumbing kind of system, right? You have high pressure on one side. If I, if I in, turn up the pressure, everything behind it is going to back up and potentially become dysfunctional. That's what happens with the right ventricle. OK. All right, pericardial disease. So pericardial disease, that's that sac around the heart. The symptoms are primarily chest pain. If you, so unlike myocarditis, if you get inflammation of the pericardium, it hurts. And it's usually this pleuritic type. So you take a breath in, ow, it hurts. That's the type of chest pain I'm talking about. Shortness of breath, the heart rate is faster than normal, swelling. So pericardium can be affected both through inflammation, which I showed you earlier. Uh, fluid can build up in the sac, the pericardium and that causes the tamponade I was talking about earlier, and then this constriction. So it's not fluid, it's just a thickening of that pericardium that's causing that cage-like atmosphere in, for the heart. Okay. Conduction disease and arrhythmias. As I said earlier, this is probably the most common finding. When I'm seeing patients with scleroderma, out of all the questions I ask about shortness of breath and chest pain, the one that probably is said, oh, yes, I have that most often is palpitations. And palpitations is hard to define. Heart fluttering, heart skipping a beat. I feel a fish flopping around in my heart, literally. And I've had multiple people describe it just like that. Um, lightheadedness can be associated with it. That's a very common symptom I hear. Passing out is... is you know, the extreme of it, but you can certainly in certain arrhythmias pass out. The most common type of arrhythmia, and I wouldn't even call it an arrhythmia, are these extra heartbeats, okay? Extra heartbeats 
can be either PVCs, which are premature ventricular complexes. So these are heartbeats coming from the bottom part of the heart, the ventricles, or PACs. So heartbeats coming from the atrium, the top part of the heart. Okay, I'm gonna get a little more specific about this because I think this is so common. What exactly are extra heartbeats, right? So extra heartbeats, we are all born with a pacemaker in our heart. It sets our heart rate. It, 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 it resides in the upper right part of our heart. And it sends a signal down to the bottom part of the heart and it tells the bottom part of the heart to contract. But we are also designed so that if that main pacemaker fails for whatever reason, we have a bunch of pacemakers, cells that act as pacemakers in our heart, both at the top and the bottom of our, our heart, that are just waiting, just waiting for the day to take over the job of the main pacemaker. Hopefully, no one's main pacemaker fails in their lifetime. So these extra pacemakers just have to sit and be quiet. But they don't like to be quiet. And so when there's inflammation in the body, and certainly in scleroderma there's a lot of inflammation, these pacemakers fire. And they fire, what happens is, they fire an electrical signal and the main pacemaker that's not dead says, what just happened? And it pauses. A little bit. And then it kicks in again. And people literally can describe that as a skipped heartbeat. I feel something just skipped. That's what it is. And it is totally benign. We all get it, whether you have scleroderma or you don't. Everyone gets it. It's just that some people are a little more sensitive to it than others, and some patients, like patients with scleroderma, are going to get it more often than others. Okay? But that's a very, very common finding. And when we put those monitors on you, we see a ton of those. Okay. All right. Yeah. Do you consider that a normal BKG? Gonna go back. So this is a normal. This would be normal EKG. This is the signal telling the bottom part of the heart to contract. At all of these spikes, bottom part of the heart contracting. This is the irregular extra heartbeat. Okay. This one, I don't know if it really you can see it, but it's coming in maybe a little earlier than the others. It's the extra heartbeat, the rogue pacemaker, if you will, gets in there. And then there's a pause because the main pacemaker that's been pacing holds off and then starts going again. That's what we see. This isn't perfect because this should probably be around here. But that's what we see. Okay, pulmonary arterial hypertension. So what is it? It's an elevation of pressure in the lungs. Okay, so when, we, when you go to your doctor's office and they put the blood pressure cuff on you, we are measuring systemic blood pressure. What's the pressure in the big tube uh, that comes out of the heart that are, where all the blood goes through, right? And if your pressure's high, that's not good. You don't want a high pressure. So pulmonary arterial hypertension is high pressure in the lungs. That's really all it means. And when we talk about arterial hypertension, we're talking about if this is the lungs here, and this is the kind of the capillaries where the arteries and the veins come together, this is the, where the arteries reside. So you have your right ventricle, goes into your pulmonary artery, and into the arterial system of your lungs, through the capillaries, into the venous system of the lungs, and then into the left side of the heart. So pulmonary arterial hypertension happens here. And you can see that as in this illustration, that uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, the pressure gets higher. <coughs> that has significant effects on the right ventricle, right? It gets bigger, it's dilated. That's that plumbing issue, right? Okay. So you, you, normally, you have a low pressure in the pulmonary system, and that allows blood flow to go from the right to the left side. But in pulmonary arterial hypertension, it's hard to get that blood through. All right. And a little bit more on pulmonary arterial. Yes? If you have low blood pressure, does that in any way correlate to the pressure in the lungs? 
That's a great question. And so the answer is no, they're, they're separate. So when, if you're talking about low blood pressure on the blood pressure cuff, that is really just measuring the systemic blood pressure. What the pressure after the heart has dumped the blood to the rest of the body. That's the pressure we're measuring. Pulmonary hypertension is within the lungs itself. We don't measure that with a blood pressure cuff. I'll, I'll, we measure it with another way, which I'll show you in a second, okay? But we don't measure it with a blood pressure cuff. All right. So pulmonary arterial hypertension, remember this is very common, particularly in patients with the limited uh, variant of, of, of scleroderma. So in this retrospective registry in the UK, about a mean follow-up of three, a little over three years, they took all these patients with connective tissue disease. And they found 484 of these patients had PAH, okay? And out of all the connective tissue diseases, three-fourths of those patients are the ones who had pulmonary arterial hypertension. So within all of these connective tissue diseases, scleroderma patients, they tend to get PAH the most, okay? And what's the likelihood of developing this? This was an interesting study where about 360 pa out of a little over 1,100 patients with scleroderma at a single center started no, no pulmonary hypertension at baseline. And then they followed them for three years, and almost 15% developed severe pulmonary hypertension in just three years. And so this study really makes the case that we got to do longitudinal um, uh, monitoring for these patients, right? The frequency we don't really know, but certainly in the high-risk patients, we want to do it at least annually. Because it can, even in three years, you can go from nothing to severe pulmonary arterial hypertension. Okay. So that's the cardiac manifestations. I'll stop there if anyone has any questions before the diagnostics. Yeah. So the annual test would be primarily for people with the diffuse kind or also for people with limited. Absolutely, for both kinds. It's just that the pulmonary hypertension happens more frequently in the limited, but this, this is all comers. Um, I've heard that there's a, a big difference in mortality rate for PAH versus PH. I'm not really understood that. Okay, that's a great question. So the question was, heard that there's more of a mortality in PAH and not PH. And what is the difference? So PH just means pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension encompasses a lot of different kinds of types of pulmonary hypertension. There is the type, for instance, I'm going to go back for a second because I think this will help. There is one type of pulmonary hypertension that only affects the venous part of it the veins by the left heart. These are patients who um, have usually diastolic dysfunction in the left side of the heart, but they develop pulmonary hypertension. So that's one type of pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary venous hypertension. So PAH is another type of pulmonary, arteria, uh, pulmonary hypertension. It's pulmonary arterial hypertension, okay? And this is the type that patients with scleroderma develop, all right? Um, is, the left, is that the left side getting bigger and applying pressure to the right side? That, so yes, so the okay. pulmonary venous hypertension, that's what that is. Okay. It's the left heart not functioning normally, whether it's getting bigger, the pressures are high, and that pressure is transmitted all the way back through the lungs to the right side of the heart. That's exactly right. That's pulmonary venous hypertension. So does that impede the oxygen exchange then? The oxygen, it, it certainly can. So a lot of patients with pulmonary arterial hypertension do have hypoxia. They, they, you know, they cannot, they don't get as good oxygen levels as patients who don't have it, yeah. So if somebody has scleroderma, they're diagnosed with diastolic um, heart failure, Yeah. but they have um, diffuse scleroderma, so they're not you know, they don't have the propensity to have pulmonary arterial hypertension, yeah. but they have the heart failure. Yeah. Are they at, they're at a higher risk to develop the venous hypertension, but would that also definitely have a higher risk to develop the 
arterial hypertension because of the diastolic heart failure? Yeah, this is such a great question. And, and the answer is, is it, it, when you have pulmonary venous hypertension, mm -hmm. you can have it isolated. So just pulmonary venous hypertension. Mm -hmm. But there is a subset of patients who have both. The pulmonary venous hypertension actually can trigger pulmonary arterial hypertension. Wow. And they call that out of proportion pulmonary venous hypertension because you have both. This is, this, is a little, this is more general than just in the scleroderma population. Uh -huh. That certainly can happen. That's why everything, you know, it's, it's better to teach in, in sort of these kind of vacuums, right? But, but in the real world, and what makes this challenging but exciting is that all of these things are, are interconnected. Mm -hmm. and, and it's rare that a person has just one. Yeah? So do you see much um, tricuspid regurgitation? Does that lead to any of this? People mm -hmm. Well, we don't see a lot of just tricuspid regurgitation in patients with scleroderma, per se. But what happens when the right ventricle gets bigger you know, the tricuspid valve is the valve in the right ventricle, right? But it separates the right ventricle from the right atrium. But you can imagine that if there is a stretching of the right ventricle, the tricuspid valve is going to be stretched too. And so when it tries to close, there's a big hole right in the middle. It can't close normally. It usually should be like this. So then you get a lot of leakage or tricuspid regurgitation. So kind of indirectly, it can cause it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I had yeah. two quick questions. Yeah. Um, the fluttering or palpitations that you're talking about, is it possible that your esophagus can flutter so they can confuse that with your heart? Is that possible? Um, I, I've not heard that. I mean, I, I've heard of spasm of the esophagus, certainly, and, and, but that's, from my understanding, much more of a painful type of process than, than a fluttering sensation. Okay, and also, if you've had cardiac ablation in the past, is it possible that scleroderma can cause conduction problems again? You mean like arrhythmias and things like that, or, or a con actual conduction disease? Well, I, my heart would just jump into hyperdrive every once in a while, you know, and they'd give me a medicine and that you know, I'd be okay. And then eventually they did cardiac ablation to fix that problem. Yeah. And I was good for a long time, and I don't know, now I'm starting to feel an feel it again. Um, I don't know if it's fluttering or, or what, yeah. but, you know, it's a little unnerving. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch upon that in a little more detail in a bit because ablation, the problem is with ablation, ablation basically is a, is a procedure that can be used to get rid of an arrhythmia. And the problem is, is that because of all the fibrosis, whereas you might target one arrhythmia, you might not be able to target all the arrhythmias that occur. And so sometimes with ablation, it might make that one arrhythmia go away for a while but there could be other arrhythmias that occur. And sometimes even ablations are not 100%, and that people need more than one ablation to get rid of, of whatever arrhythmia that they have. Okay. So with cardiac testing, I'm gonna spend the majority of time, and then I have about 15 minutes maybe left, um, 20 minutes, uh, imaging. Because imaging is really, this is the key part, uh, and the part that I do, and, 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 and where we find all the good information. So on the left is a picture of an echo machine. I'm sure all of you uh, have had an echo, uh, or maybe have heard of an echo. I, I couldn't find a good picture of an MRI machine, but I thought this was appropriate because no one likes going in a, in a dark tube in the MRI. But the information we get from it is uh, very helpful. OK, so here's a good. Uh, example, I don't know if you can see it uh, with the lights on, but here's a good example of a normal left ventricle. I'm going to use my cursor here so I don't have to point. So here, normal left ventricle on echo. This is that part of the heart that's pumping. And then an abnormal uh, right here, abnormal. Do you guys see the, do you see the difference when you put them side by side? That normal one is squeezing, it's coming in together much better than the abnormal one, which is barely coming in. Okay, that's what I mean by systolic dysfunction, left ventricular dysfunction. The pump's not working well. Okay? All right, I'm gonna switch to MRI. The, this is an example of an MRI. 
looking again at the left ventricle on this side and the left ventricle here. Now the left ventricle is pumping normally on both sides, but the right ventricle, that's here, it's pumping normally here, but you can see, and I'll let you just look at it side by side, the right ventricle on this side is not pumping normally. It's not squeezing, and it's bigger than the left ventricle, and that should never be the case, okay? So that's the difference uh, between right and left ventricular dysfunction. Okay. This is a free, uh, real breathing, real-time MRI, meaning that these patients are in the MRI scanner and they're just told to breathe, and we're just kind of running, running the show here, just a, a, just a cine image. So what are you looking at? So I'm going to try to clarify that. Here's your heart again, right? This is called the long axis of the heart. Here's the tip of the heart, and here's the base of the heart. And if I were to cut the heart up like a bread loaf into these different slices, you would now end up with the short axis of the heart. And so this is a slice through that. Do you understand that now? So this is the left ventricle, and this is the right ventricle. I'm cut it in slices, all right? This is the short axis. So specifically, what we're looking at here is very subtle. But we are trying to identify disease before it causes problems. What we're looking for is specifically at the septum, the part that separates the left and the right ventricle. What we're, see what we're trying to see is any kind of septal flattening of that septum to indicate early disease of the right ventricle. And so it's hard to even see it, especially with the lights on, but it's hard to really see any difference between the two here. But there is a subtle septal flattening in that abnormal one that you can't see on the, on the normal one. And that's the kind of stuff when we are risk assessing patients that we're looking for on the MRI, these subtle signs. Okay, MRI is also really good because it can actually show us that fibrosis. Yeah. What are the indications for an MRI of the heart? That's a good question. Well, in, in, in scleroderma, it's primarily when we suspect that things like fibrosis or um, pericardial disease, which we can see really well on the MRI, is the cause of the problem, uh, you know, of the symptoms that we're seeing in clinic. That's when we do MRIs. And we do MRIs on all our patients who undergo stem cell transplant because it gives us much more information. Um, but that's, that's pretty much indication, yeah. Does the left ventricle or the right ventricle cause more problems? Does it matter? Yeah, so that's good. So, you know, in, in most diseases, the left ventricle is the one that causes all the problems. And the right ventricle is ignored and has been ignored in the literature, general cardiology, for decades. But in scleroderma, for whatever reason, the right ventricle seems to be affected much, much more than the left ventricle. We don't know, we don't have the answer to it. We're working on it, but I'm going to show you an example of that in a sec. Okay, so here's actual scar. I don't know if you can see it, but this myocardium, is, it's all supposed to be black around here. There's these white areas. You see where the arrows are pointing to the white areas? That, those white areas are scar. That's fibrosis. Now, this is another, probably a better picture. This is fibrosis inside the myocardium where the arrows are pointing. This is what we call myocarditis or inflammation or fibrosis of the myocardium. In scleroderma, we don't typically actually see those, those areas of fibrosis with the naked eye. Most patients with scleroderma get diffuse fibrosis. So we can't see it. It's within the myocardial fibers. So you actually can't see it with the naked eye. So we have a way on MRI to calculate how much fibrosis someone has. And so this is the example I'm talking about where this is one of my patients who has scleroderma. And what we're doing here is calculating diffuse fibrosis. And there's a color scale right here. And the higher the color, or the, I'm sorry, the lighter the color, the more fibrosis. So in the left ventricle, that's this, 
when we look at the muscle, it's dark or darker, right? But in the right ventricle, that's this. When you look at the myocardium, it's lighter. You all see that? This is lighter than the darker myocardium on the left. So that means there is so much more fibrosis in the right than in the left in this patient. And what's, I, I think, even more interesting is this patient does not have pulmonary hypertension. This is not due to pulmonary hypertension. This is due to some intrinsic Direct, remember, direct effect on the myocardium. Okay. And this is MRI? That's MRI. And in our study, we actually show that this measure of fibrosis correlates very well with skin fibrosis. And other studies have also shown that too, that in scleroderma patients, they tend to have higher <coughs> myocardial fibrosis as well as higher skeletal diffuse fibrosis. All of this is MRI. Okay. Stress MRI. You've heard of stress tests before. Stress tests we usually do to look for blockages in the arteries of the heart. Okay. So here's an example of a patient with a blockage in the artery of the heart. This is not a patient who has scleroderma. But this is an MRI, short access. So in the, in, at rest, what we're doing here is we're going to watch contrast go into the left ventricle here from the right ventricle. And you see that it's completely homogenous, right? Everything lights up very nicely. And we give them a stress agent, and we do the same thing, and contrast goes into the left ventricle, and watch closely. Wait for it. Do you see this dark rim? That means this person has a blockage in this area of the heart. That's how we do stress MRI, okay? So, we do stress MRI in patients with scleroderma, not so much because we think they have a blockage, but because patients with scleroderma get a lot of microvascular disease. What does that mean? That is the arteries, the coronaries, the arteries of the heart, it's like an upside down tree. You have the trunk and then the branches that cover the heart and those branches break off into little branches and little branches and then the tiny branches that you can't see, a lot of gunk gets in there and the vasospasm happens there. And you end up with microvascular disease. And you can see that on MRI, you get this diffuse circumferential darkness. And that is on MRI almost pathognomonic, meaning there's really not much else uh, other than microvascular disease. All right. Um, I'm gonna skip this for the sake of time. Um, well, I'm, I really like it, so I'm going to tell you about it. Okay, so again, you know, you remember we were looking at the septal flattening, right, as an early marker of disease. We can also use something called strain. Strain imaging allows us to measure the change in the length of an individual myocardial fiber as it stretches and it, it shrinks during the cardiac cycle, okay? And this is a much, much more sensitive marker than ejection fraction. How many of you have heard of ejection fraction before? Yeah, that's what we use all the time clinically. Ejection fraction is a measure of how well the heart's pumping, okay? But watch this. This patient's totally normal. Normal ejection fraction, normal negative 19% strain. Normal, normal, normal. But this patient who has scleroderma and some mild disease here has a normal ejection fraction, but now a, a reduction in their strength. Less negative value means worse. And by the time you get to a uh, decrease in the ejection fraction, you are way, way down in strain. So strain can give you some insight very early on that there might be a problem with the heart function. And one of the things strain correlates with is fibrosis. So this is what we're detecting. We're detecting the fibrosis. And there's studies on this in scleroderma patients, both RV strain, you see it there. You even see it with left atrial strain, the top chamber of the heart. So definitely something that we do. Pericarditis, 
This is an example of a patient on echo who has, a, you can't see the pericardium, but it is thick, it's preventing the heart from expanding. That's why you get that funny septum wiggling back and forth. But on MRI, so here's an indication for it, you can clearly see that pericardium. Look at this ring around the heart. That is an inflamed, thickened pericardium, and it comes up beautifully on MRI. Um, here are examples on MRI. There's fluid, so the cardiac tamponade, the funny septum, and then that line around the heart, that pericardial thickness. They are, they are always done in public contrast. Yeah, so they don't have to be, but the, to get those images, to get the things to light up and stress, you have to use contrast. Remember with MRI, though, it's a different type of contrast than CAT scan. So um, the, the, the reasons why we can't use contrast in MRI are actually a little less uh, than ones for like CT, okay? Another cool thing for MRI is that we can actually look at blood flow in the pulmonary arteries. This is from the right ventricle into the lungs. So in patients who have pulmonary arterial hypertension, you can actually see a difference in flow, as shown here, versus someone who has normal flow. Look very closely here. You can see the spinning. You see the spinning here in the, I'll move my finger. It's this vortex of flow, and that is abnormal. That means this patient has high pressures in their lungs. So you can use MRI to also look at this as well. Okay, so less cool stuff. Uh, but still important, rhythm monitors. So not imaging, but rhythm monitors, because a lot of patients get arrhythmias, will put a monitor on you. Either it's going to be a patch, or it's going to be this, this thing here. I, I don't know who marketed this, but obviously most people are going to want the patch. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, that's, I guess that's real, but uh, anyway. Uh, okay, and then lastly, right heart catheterization. Right heart catheterization, actually I actually have a whole link of how to do it, but I'm not going to go into it. This is how you measure for pulmonary arterial hypertension. The question came up earlier, uh, you know, is systemic blood pressure the same, you know, is it, does it correlate with pulmonary hypertension? You use a blood pressure cuff for systemic pressure, but you've got to use an invasive test to measure pulmonary arterial hypertension. So it's this catheter that goes either through your neck or through your groin, and it measures pressures in the heart and the lung. That is the gold standard for measuring pulmonary hypertension. Okay, I have eight minutes. So treatment. Uh, in terms of medications, uh, there are a variety of medications depending on what the patient has. Okay, so we have drugs called calcium channel blockers, nifedipine, micardipine, amlodipine, these are drugs that are given for vasospasm um, or arrhythmias, too, because they can help lower the heart rate. We typically don't give things like metoprolol. Those are beta blockers. You might have heard of that drug before. Why? Because metoprolol and beta blockers cause vasoconstriction. So we typically just we stay away from those and give calcium channel blockers. All right. Uh, drugs called ACE inhibitors, lisinopril, things like that, spironolactone, that is drugs that we give for dysfunction of the right ventricle or the left ventricle. Of course, diuretics for swelling, steroids, immunosuppressive therapy for myocarditis or worsening fibrosis, inflammation, and then there are pulmonary vasodilators for patients who have um, pulmonary arterial hypertension, sildenafil, um, things like that. Okay. Just a word on stem cell transplantation. You know, this was uh, something you, you might have seen in earlier talks. This is from the New England Journal of Medicine paper published a year ago looking at patients who either got 12, um, uh, 12 cycles of uh, cyclophosphamide, 12 monthly injections of cyclophosphamide, or stem cell. And, and if five minutes, okay, great. And in all of these, transplanted better, okay? The key thing when it comes to the heart and transplant is if you don't have a good heart before you undergo transplant, you're not going to benefit as much. 
And the risk of complications is much higher in those patients. And it's, why is a bad heart a bad thing? Because cyclophosphamide directly affects the heart muscle, all the fluid loading, if you have someone already on the verge of heart failure, not good. And an immunosuppressed state, when someone gets an infection, you want a healthy heart, okay? This is just some data that from our transplant cohort, the skin score dramatically improved, which is not uh, something that would be so surprising, but also a measure of RV function, RV strain, also significantly improved. This is just 30 patients. Um, I wanna get to this crazy slide really quick, because I, I, th this is just a, a remarkable, I think. You know, I think part of when it comes to the heart and it comes to scleroderma, part of the problem that we have is how we classify patients with scleroderma. I've been talking this whole time about limited variant, diffuse variant. We talk about how much skin involvement there is in autoantibodies, but do we actually really have a good classification scheme? And I would argue, no, we, we really don't. We're basing it on things that um, are probably not the best way, especially in this day and age when we can get genetic testing and all that. And so there is um, all, everyone is really excited in the cardiology world and beyond about machine learning. Using computers basically to help us better phenotype or classify patients. So this is a paper that took a little over 300 patients with scleroderma and it fed them into a computer. And they took a bunch of clinical parameters and a bunch of echo parameters and they said, computer, divide these patients up into the most common groups. And it divided them up into four phenotypes, four groups. This group, the authors validated this in a smaller study, in a smaller group of uh, patients with scleroderma. And then they used gene testing. They used um, from skin biopsies. And they, they put the two together. And what they found is really interesting. They found these four different groups, and each of them have very different um, characteristics. So that first phenogroup over there are patients who have uh, short, they have not had the scleroderma that long, okay? But they have a very high skin score, and they have no cardiac involvement. The patients in two are patients who've had scleroderma for a long, long time, but they don't have cardiac or a lot of skin involvement. Group three are patients who have a high skin score, but they have almost 90% of them have interstitial lung disease, and the majority of them have right ventricular dysfunction. No or very little pulmonary hypertension. And then group four are patients who've had the disease for a while, who don't have a lot of skin involvement, but who have biventricular, both ventricles of the heart. So very different classification. And what we found is that the patients in group three and four, they do worse than those patients in group one and two. Um, the other thing when we put the skin score with it is it's, it's pretty remarkable. In the first group, this is the group with the highest skin score, there's a genetic defect. They would have the, this was the group that had the genetic defect in skin integrity. So it actually correlated very nicely with that. And in group four, remember that's the group that has biventricular dysfunction. They had genetic abnormalities in causing fibrosis. So it seems to link very nicely with these different groups that the computer helped us to uh, come up with. And the, the, the reason this is in the therapeutic section is because we need to be able to phenotype or classify these patients better in order to better treat, okay? So I'm gonna skip this, skip this, and I'm gonna get to this slide. This is the algorithm that we kind of use at Northwestern that we think makes sense. Very busy, I'm gonna break it up. So start with symptoms. If patients don't have any of those symptoms I talked about earlier, we will do an EKG, an echo, and a blood test called a BNP, which allows us to see if there's any heart kind of failure involvement. If there's no abnormality, we do this annually. If there is, then those patients, if, if we see them, obviously, we do more tests, or they get referred to us, and we do more tests. And from those tests, 
If we find that they have LV dysfunction, we ask, do you have chest pain? If they have chest pain, then we usually do a coronary angiogram. We look inside the arteries of the heart. Typically, you're not gonna find a big blockage like patients who have a heart attack. Instead, what you're gonna find are patients who have that microvascular disease, okay? They have chest pain because the little air parts of their vessels are all gunked up. If they don't have chest pain, we usually do a stress test, and if that's normal, then we just we treat their left ventricular dysfunction. They have right ventricular dysfunction, we do a right heart cath. Why? Because that is the gold standard for measuring pulmonary hypertension. We gotta rule that out at least. If they have pericarditis, we're gonna treat with anti-inflammatories, uh, and sometimes it does progress to constrictive pericarditis, which I talked about, and we'll have to do more testing. And then arrhythmias, usually we'll treat with calcium channel blockers or antiarrhythmics, and sometimes we'll refer to EP in order to, for ablations or things like that to get done, okay? So in summary, cardiac complications are common. They lead to adverse outcomes. Vasospasm, inflammation, they are the key components to myocardial fibrosis, right? Heart failure, pericarditis, arrhythmias, pulmonary hypertension, these are common manifestations. I would say arrhythmias are probably the most common. And echo, MRI in particular, and sometimes right heart cath are very helpful in making diagnoses. And finally, therapies do exist, but better phenotyping, perhaps by machine learning, better genotyping, might lead to more targeted treatments. That's it. Thank you very much.